Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald or Assassin Auto back doing another webinar for Jonathan Little. Today we're going to be discussing the five post flop tricks you can use. This is some unconventional wisdom, but definitely really fun uh, when you get into it. So let's just go ahead. What you will learn in today's webinar. Today I will show you some unconventional post flop plays that I don't always get to teach. I've used these in the field constantly to great effect. I appreciate you guys being here today so I can get these ideas on paper. So let's get you right in the action because that's gonna be really fun. If you've never done a lesson with me before, I'd recommend you have a pen and paper for notes so you can write down what your answer was and then compare it with my own answers. In this hand, you're in the middle stages of a tournament. You raise on the button with ace of diamonds, 10 of clubs. The big one calls you. He has been your typical reg willing to mix it up just a little bit. The flop comes jack of diamonds, five of diamonds, four of spades. The big blind checks to you. Here, what would you like to do? So I'm gonna go into the chat here, see what everybody says. Oops, my little timer. So we got a few people saying C bet. A lot of people looking like they're liking that. Got a few people saying check, a few people saying two thirds pot. And, all right, I'm just going to cut that one short because I think a lot of you guys already know. So time's up. Already know what you want to do there. Technically, any bet here should turn a profit. That's why I'm not putting the red color on any of the options because all B, C, D, and E even turn a profit. But with the Ace of Diamonds and Ace High, I like putting this hand in my checking range because there's a lot of turn cards that allow me to call. I... I would typically lean toward that one if you're trying to be a little more careful versus opponents. So you check here, and the turn comes the 10 of spades and the big blind leads out. What do you wanna do? This one I'll give you the full 30 on. So Bob in Florida says he would like to call. And we got a whole lot of calls. Uh, Jeff said raise to 750. Pretty much everybody is saying call here. So I'm going to give you guys about 15 more seconds there because my little timer is uh, having some fun with the webinar software. So we have a few calls. All right, so let's get into this. This one's a really fun one, guys. So you can call, a call is totally fine, but another play that a lot of people never consider here that is really helpful is raising to 900. One person said raise to 750. I don't mind that as well. Uh, I found this one player years ago uh, when I was trying to study outliers in the data. So what I was trying to do is I was just studying as many poker players as I can, uh, just professional players that were kind enough to open up uh, with their hands that I could analyze with. And I found one guy who is very successful and very unconventional that used to do this play a lot. And when you analyze it, it, it really makes a lot of sense. Now, when I show this play to many people, they seem aghast, which means we're not thinking about everything we could possibly be thinking about when we play. Because think about it this way, there's three categories of hands in most situations if you want to simplify things heads up. There's two pair or better pairs in high cards. Whenever you're doing basic ranging and you're having a hard time visualizing your opponent's range, you should just start with that. Now, as far as us playing two pair or better pairs or high cards when we play poker, two pairs or better are easy to play. Uh, and you tend to just play them fast and you usually get value. There's very few players who can make high cards work for value. That's why it's always on poker Twitter when a guy makes a big call with them. It's such a rarity. How you will play pairs will make or break you and no limit hold them. Always think of a raise or bet first. Get in that habit. If you just auto call with pairs or pot control, there are times that can be okay, but you'll never make as much money as you could possibly make versus low to medium stakes opponents who will let you get considerable value. Think of what he's leading out here. So 
we check back on this flop of jack of diamonds, five of diamonds, four of spades. So what you're looking at right now is Flopzilla. I really love Flopzilla because it's great for helping us visualize ranges because otherwise that's very difficult for the mind to do, uh, to put all these combinations together at once. So we have our hand right here is underneath dead cards and here is the flop and this is his range, we suppose. So we check back on this flop, which means we keep in his entire preflop calling range. You'll notice you have 54% equity versus his leading range here if he leads draws in second pairs, which is pretty typical. So what you're looking at here, what I did is uh, I put a blue filter next to everything I thought was leading, and I didn't have him leading weak pairs, but I did have him leading middle pairs and the flush draws and open-ended straight draws. And right here, I click this button from red to green, and that gives us a good idea of how much equity we have versus this range, which would be 54%. Now, I think that's a very conservative estimate because most guys lead any pair there, and if he's leading any pair there, like many guys do after the flop, goes check, check, you have 65% equity. That doesn't even account for any bluffs. The other question I always want to ask my friends there when – they call, calling is fine, but it puts you in a sticky situation. I believe it's more profitable to raise, especially versus basic competition or just low to mid stakes players. Uh, if you're playing a $500 event in Vegas, this will work really well, a $1,000 event. But if you were calling on that turn, I always want to know what was your plan on the river? A river three, eight, queen, king, nine, diamond, or spade was bad for you. Unless you're the best at staring at a guy and knowing if he has it, you should raise here and get value while you can. The vast majority of guys will just call with their draws there. If they raise again, they, they only have one card to come and they committed their 50 big blind stack. If they have a pair, they'll convince themselves you have a draw and call to, quote, reevaluate on the river. Get your money now. By the way, if you're playing live and they check to you dark on the river, that's usually not a draw. Draws want the option to lead the river. If the guy leads the river, it tends to be the joint. He made his draw. If he checks to you, you have the option of firing again for thin value too, based on his turn call. You still want this option if the river is a 10 or an ace. That's why of the five post-flop tricks you can use, the first one is Raise pairs on the turn to get money from weak leads. All right, guys, let's do another one. In this hand, I'm going to keep them coming fast today. In this hand, you raise 8-9 suited on the button. You are playing a live $200 tournament in Vegas versus a nice guy in his mid-40s. He calls out of the big blind. This board comes out 7 of spades, 5 of spades, 4 of clubs. He checks to you. We bet the flop 300 into 630. He calls pretty quickly and casually. He shakes his wrist out after he puts in the call like his wrist is hurting. The turn is the queen of hearts and he checks. What would you like to do here? So I'm going to go into the chat, see what people are thinking. And I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep firing <laughs> playing around with my clock here. So we got a few people C, we got a few people saying D, a few people saying B, a lot of people saying A. We are all over the map here in the chat. A few people are saying, like, I feel like he's gonna call again. Douglas Wright says bet 1.5x pot. Bob says three fourths pot. It's a fun one. Think of how many times you're in this spot, right? We should give it a lot of thought right now. We'll think about this a lot, like right here, and then that will set us up for like the next 3,000 times this will come up. Well, an option a lot of people don't think about. Again, this is another one of those situations in No Limit Hold'em where you can justify a lot of different actions, but there's certain ones that seem to work really well in low to medium stakes games. If you check there because you go, look, this guy's got a seven or a five and he's not folding, I think there's a lot of credibility for that. A check here is fine. 
Betting the turn is good too, but only if you're willing to triple barrel and many guys aren't willing to do that. But the option many people don't consider is the overbet here on the turn. Guys, when he calls you on the flop automatically there, what does he have? Like what is the best hand he has? That's another great thing to think about. Every time you see bet a flop, think about what is the best hand he could have? He didn't need to think. If he flopped a set there, don't you think he would need to think about raising? Even if he had the nuts here, he'd have to think about raising with the flush draw out there. He probably would have three bet 10-10 and higher preflop. Two pair, if he had two pair on that board, he would need to think about raising. When he calls on that flop, his range caps out at a pair of sevens, maybe pocket eights. Could you imagine being in his spot with in checking here on the turn in a live tournament and a guy bets 2,000 into 1,200? How would you feel with 10-7 of diamonds here? Would you be thinking, yes, he bet 2K into 1,200 and I have 10-7 on a 7-5-4 queen board and there's still one street to play. Awesome. Most people, what it, I do this play a lot, and I do it a lot with low to mid six players. What most people do is they yell at me and then they fold their five or something like that, right? If you don't like this play, this overbet, let me ask a couple of questions. One, have you ever done it? I do this play a lot and it really works a lot of the time. I, I fully admit one time out of 10, I get caught, right? but that doesn't dissuade me from doing it the other nine out of 10 times. My first question is always, have you ever done it? Because if I said I hate this book, but I've never read it, you'd think I was a crazy person. But many people in poker don't even analyze a play before they poo poo it. My second question, what does he have to defend with there in order to not be getting exploited? This is really interesting, guys. Pay attention to this. Let's say he calls us with some straights and over pairs, and he check raises his flush draws, and he doesn't call with gut shots. That is a lot of stipulations I'm giving this guy in his favor. Normally on that turn, he's sitting holding his extremities with half the earth and gut shots in his range, but we'll give him this, okay? So if we bet 2,000 into the turn, that's even more than 1.5x pot, okay? So we would be risking 2,000 to win 3,180 because we do get back our bet when it succeeds. If you think about it, if you're flipping a coin and each of you are putting up 50 bucks, you wouldn't do 50 divided by 50 because then it would just be one and you don't need to succeed at a coin flip 100% of the time. It would be 50 divided by 100. So if we bet 2,000 into the turn, even more than 1.5x the pot, that, then this bet needs to work 63% of the time, which means he needs to call or raise or do something with 37% of the hands he called the flop with. Even if he calls on the turn with every single seven, he's still not hitting 37%. By the way, if he calls... If he just calls, we get a free chance to hit an eight, nine, or six. He's giving us more equity. And if he calls on the flop with flush draws and gut shots, he's folding on the turn 72% of the time, even if he calls with every single seven. So what you're seeing is uh, I've isolated what he check called with on the flop and then I took it to the turn and we assume he's probably folding, you know, just his bare straight draws and flush draws on that turn. And then even if he's defending with every single seven, because so much has missed on that turn, he's still folding 72% of the time. And honestly, when I do this play, because I mean, think about it, you're in this spot, guys. <laughs> Remember, our bet only needed to work 62% of the time. And it's likely working 72% of the time if he's only defending 28% of the time. Also, imagine having 9-7 of diamonds here, guys, in a Vegas tournament, and somebody just bet 20x into you. You probably would just 
if you figured it out, good for you. But I have a lot of people show me the hand after two minutes of thinking, and they're just like, fine, take it. You end up looking a little bit like an imbecile who's overplaying their set, who's really worried about a flush art, which is great. That's the exact image we want. That's why of the five post-flop tricks you can use, number two is overbet the turn when your opponent caps his range. All right, guys, here we go. We're going to keep them coming. You're in a live tournament in Vegas, a 1K. The cutoff is a younger guy. He's been very aggressive so far, although you don't know a ton about him. You call out of the big blind because you're not sure what to do versus his four bet if you three bet, and you think he's probably four betting often. You want to give him a chance to hang himself. The board comes jack of diamonds, seven of clubs, four of clubs. You check call on this flop to allow him to keep firing. This turn comes out, the two of hearts. You check to him and he quickly bets 450. You call. The river is the king of hearts. Now here, do you want to lead out? Do you want to check fold? Do you want to check call? Or do you want to check raise? Let's see your guys' answers. So we have one. We have one. We have a lot of people saying C, a few people saying check raise. Some people say bat. Bob said bat. Mike C said check call. I'm going to give you a few sections. A few of you, few of you had questions. Uh, I'll be sure to answer that at the end. All right, everybody. So what you should do is you should lead out here. You should bet 1300. Why lead there? Guys, what did you think of this turn lead? I want you guys looking for this because you'll see this a lot from grinding regulars, okay? I, I really pay attention to this next part because I started making way more money at No Limit Hold'em once I started being able to spot this. What did you think of his turn lead? Think about it. If he had a set, wouldn't he be trying to get more value? If he had a draw, wouldn't he be betting more trying to get us to fold a seven or something like that? What he's doing is what a lot of aggressive players do. It's called buying the showdown. Unfortunately, he's doing it to a player who can see through it and he's given away the strength of his hand through his sizing. So in this guy's defense, this play is going to work versus most people because, well, 90% of the people in the chat didn't say lead out. So if he is trying to get a cheap showdown and get a little value out of 5-6, uh, maybe some lesser pairs, some flush rows and whatnot, uh, he's going to get a showdown, a really cheap showdown there. It's a good play, but I want you guys to be able to spot it so you can take advantage of them. And the way a lot of them give it away if he just bets a normal amount here, it's really hard to pick up on it unless you've seen the guy bet really thin on the turn before. That's why you should always be taking notes when you play. But if the guy under bets, he really gives it away. It's really hard to find a person who will do that with a set or a draw. That's usually a pair that's trying to get to a showdown really cheaply. So if you have something like Ace Jack, which is beating almost all those pairs, you you have to lead out there. He and just so you guys can see this, the ranging side, he see that's likely a hundred percent of his range versus a big blind flatter. That is reality. Most guys do that a little too much. Uh, we did say he was aggressive, not a pot controller. And if that's the case, when he bets that small on the turn, he gives away that he has a pair that he's trying to get to showdown. We have 74% equity against that range. Even if he's doing that with over pairs, which he's usually not. That king of hearts is not likely to have helped our opponent. We still have the best hand seven times out of 10. If we lead, he's likely to call wide because he can always justify it to himself as a missed flush draw or straight draw to hero call with. 
If this is a live tournament, the guy doesn't even have to show his hand. In his mind, you're polarized. You have just the absolute best hand or you have a lot of missed draws. And aggressive players like this guy is really wants to play all the time. So that'll make him want to call with all the missed draws out there. So this looks really good for us. They'll usually muck something like this that wanted to check back the river. That's why the third of the five post-flop tricks you can use is lead the river for value versus opponents who are trying to buy the showdown. All right, guys, I'm going to keep them going fast. It's more fun that way. Let's start with something I see a lot of you guys doing, just calling out of the big blind 50 big blinds deep when your opponent raises the cutoff and you're in the big blind, okay? So your opponent raises here in the cutoff to 2.5x. You're about 50x deep. You don't really know what to do when you three bet, any four bets. So you just go ahead and call. You tell me the guy is aggressive and decent, so you don't want to deal with that when you three bet. So let's go with that. He's aggressive and decent. Let's pretend we're playing against that guy. All right, so we call here. We get this awesome flop. What is your plan of action? You want to donk lead, check call, then check the turn? Do you want to check call, then lead the turn? Or do you want to check raise? Let's see those answers. So we have all over the place. Can't even. <laughs> I love how active you guys are in the chat. Oops, let me get that timer going again. We have a few people saying it is it is evenly distributed all across. <laughs> A lot of people saying C, a lot of people saying B, a few people saying D, some people saying A. All right. Now, okay, so we're done there. This is a really fun one. I love this as a thought experiment because now that you're looking at all of them, it's kind of crazy you pick B all the time, right? When I started playing, I used to do B there all the time, like check, call, then check. Not really thinking like, what is he bluffing? <laughs> Most people, when they see that that board and you check the turn, they go, oh, he's got an ace. Like, okay, I'm done. Now, here's a better question. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know every single one of these turns a profit, obviously. You have the deck hammered. Which one do you think makes the most money? The one I found makes the most money on average, and I have actually tried this out a lot of different ways is the check raise. Check call lead works very well, but people are getting a little wary to it. I notice a lot of you guys pick that one. That's a good option as well. Check call check, I don't think gets as many bluffs as maybe it used to back when people were a little bit more flippant uh, about what they did. Uh, Dark lead does turn a profit. The problem is it, it, if the guy has like 10, eight of diamonds, you just lose that C bet that you're most likely going to get when you just completed from the big blind. So the one that tends to make the most money is the check raise. Every time I do this against an aggressive player, they seem to have this one thought. He wouldn't do that with an ace. He's so polarized here. So I get 600 more from eight, eight, nine, nine, 10, 10, Jack, Jack, queen, queen, even though I lose them on the turn a lot. But even though there's not much difference, the aces in this guy's range seem to go broke a lot. Good players that I've never really seen make a mistake before will really overcommit here. It blows my mind when I see people not wanting to put players in this spot now, especially now when hero calling has become so in vogue. And you can't know for a fact he's raising king three here king three suited there, but for sure he's raising all of his suited aces and most likely most of his offsuit aces. So the ace high board is a great board to play fast for value because he has so many hands you're going to be making so much money from. That's why the fourth post-flop trick you can use is check raise ace high boards with the best kickers. So, all right, guys, we have one more. I... 
I tried to keep these a little quicker tonight because your time is very valuable to me and just want to keep it fun. So in this hand, you are at the beginning of a tournament, a hundred big blinds. You know nothing about any of the opponents yet. You raise on the button. The big blind calls you. The board comes ace of hearts, two of hearts, three of clubs. It's check to you. What is your bet? So Jennifer says one third. Chad says two thirds. And we got a couple E's. Most people are saying B or D. <laughs> Douglas says, this is fun, Alex, all caps. Uh-oh, okay. I, my, time, my timer is fighting with me a lot tonight because I'm reading your guys' chat. Okay, so most people got their answer. And this is a spot we all tend to play the same way, but if you think about it, it's one of those spots we do automatically. And we should really think about this a bit more because... I think honestly the correct answer is E. Uh, ch check. Let's say you have a hyper aggressive opponent. Check can work if you think he's just going to bluff his butt off on the turn in river, but that's a very rare situation. So I did assign that a red designation. Obviously, betting one third pot, a half pot, two thirds pot does show a profit, but I think three fourths pot is what you want, it, as big as you can get. This is one the GTO guys taught me, and it just makes perfect sense once you think of it. The fun stuff about the GTO things and the solvers is sometimes, or just any AI you bring into poker, is sometimes the computer will say, do this, and you'll go, why? Why does nobody do that? And then you think about it for a while, and it makes perfect sense. You're obviously betting for value here, right? What hand is your opponent calling 300 with that he's not calling 550 with? A flush draw will call. You want all the aces to start paying you big, and there's a ton of them. His king highs and pocket sixes will still likely call you once based on how deep your stacks are. If we're not betting big here, we're just leaving money on the table. Now, the funny question is, People say, so what do you do if you miss this flop? To me, this is the most exploitative line ever, right? Because if, you're, if you want to be balanced, you have to pick one bet here and go with it, right? So if you miss, you should go big, and you'll still turn a profit, right? And when you hit, you should go big. And, or you can go really small. But I honestly think if nobody knows who you are, this guy in the big blind, if he has like queen seven of diamonds, if you breathe on this pot, he's folding. And that's pretty much the only hands that are going to fold. King high is probably not folding to anything, but anything below queen high is folding to anything. So if you're betting trying to get a fold, this is very exploitative and you cannot exploit others without become ex be becoming exploitable yourself. If nobody knows who you are, I'd just bet a third pot if you miss this board, assuming this is just the first hand. But if I hit, I would bet bigger. Now, obviously, as the game goes on, you can't keep that up. You should adapt a balance strategy, or if you wanna play ball, if you wanna play money ball, you can try to play rock, paper, scissors and outguess the guy, just like major league pitchers do. It's up to you. Neither is wrong. Both schools of thought can learn from each other. There should not be this big war between the GTO guys and the exploitative guys. Most of the GTO practitioners will tell you that they use a lot of exploitative lines and the exploitative guys should learn vice versa, right? So anyways, guys, recapping, the five post-flop tricks you can use. Number one, Raise pairs on the turn to get money from weak leads. Number two, overbet the turn when your opponent caps his range. Number three, lead the river for value versus opponents who are trying to buy the showdown. Number four, 
Check raise ace high boards with the best kickers. And number five, bet bigger on ace high boards when you have the ace. All right, guys, thank you for attending today. I know your time is valuable and everybody on the internet is competing for it. So I appreciate the time you spent with me today. Today's free lesson was brought to you by the Tournament Assassin Package, which is on sale for just a few short days. Normally, How to Think Like a Poker Player is $300, and Master the Flop is $300, and each of these Test Your Poker episodes is $30, so they normally be $720. But for a limited time, you can get all of this for $99. Because Jonathan Little loves you guys, apparently. The thing I like about this package is it works together so nicely. How to think like a poker player is about thinking deep in tournaments when your energy stores are depleted. It's about simplifying the situation to the most important inputs and attacking. That video package, 10 episodes in all, will have you attacking the blinds, attacking preflop raisers, and defending your big blind better than anyone else in your tournament. Once you master those essentials, master the flop will guide you on an overall system that will see you outplaying your opponents on a multitude of boards, including suited boards, wheel boards, paired boards, straight and flush draw boards, small card boards, and everything in between. It will help you think about the game more actively and attack on the turn and river more. Finally, the test your poker episodes will hammer everything you just learned to make sure you have it, and it will introduce you to some plays rarely seen on film. You'll understand the true mathematics behind four betting and some other unorthodox plays that didn't make this lecture. So th these are some testimonials from Master the Flop, uh, which were very kind, so I'm gonna read out to you. Ken Cormanis said, in my opinion, this is your best content ever. Don Klein said, I started using the Master of the Flop techniques in a $340 seniors tournament yesterday at Parks Big Stacks event near Philadelphia. What I learned helped me make the final table. And John Noel said, I love your webinar, Master of the Flop, and the PBSH's method, which you'll learn about if you pick this up. When I put it in practice, I have good results on micro stakes. And Mary Beth said, I have already started implementing Master of the Flop into my study routine. I've been working on board textures and it's a perfect fit. I really appreciate them saying that. Uh, and how to think like a poker player, this was the one I really liked the most. So after years of watching many, excuse me, after years of reading many poker books and watching video tutorials, nothing seemed to make a big difference in my tournament results. I was in that 95% zone of losing players most of the time. Alex's coaching material was the only thing that helped me table a big tournament's final table in my local casino just after watching one of his master classes, this one, How to Think Like a Poker Player. I feel very grateful. I won in that tournament more than my total winnings playing poker for years. Thank you a lot, Alex. You're a life changer. All right, guys, thank you for attending today. I'll answer your questions now in just a second. Uh, but just a demo of how this site works. Let me show you that. So let's bring that up. So if you go to the site, which you'll see, just pokercoaching.com slash assassin. Right here, you just enter it in. And it's going to bring it up here in just a second. And then you'll get to learn more about the package. If you have more questions, you can read the testimonials yourself. And at the bottom, you can see everything that the value. Oh, and the other thing I forgot to bring up, the total value of this is actually $1,200 because I will be doing two live Q&A webinars uh, just to answer questions about this product for people who pick it up. And if you want to use this coupon code, you just go to the bottom and you hit apply, coupon code applied, and then you add it to your cart and we'll just take it from there. So let me bring up this again. And there we go. Once again, I really appreciate you all attending. It means a lot to me. You'd spend your time learning about poker from me. I really appreciate that, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Good luck to all of you. All right, guys, I'll answer your questions now in just a second.
I will be right there. I'm just taking the recording I just did. Ann says, thank you for your amazing content. You are welcome, Ann. Robert says, in the third hand, could a smallish bet be seen as a blocking bet also? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Lawrence says, thank you, very instructional. Mm. So Douglas has, uh, when a player checks and you bet that same player re-raises your bet, what does that mean Do you just call? Douglas, people tend to be really poor at raising post-flop as a bluff, especially at low to medium stakes. Because if you think about it, have you ever seen a guy get caught bluffing at the table? What's the general consensus? It's always like, oh, look at you trying. So people, they, they feel shamed and they don't do it again, you know? So it tends to be the hand. That's not, that's not 100%, but it does come up. So, and uh, someone said, could you show the five tips again? Yeah, I'll show that in just a second, guys. So uh, uh, one second, everybody. I just want to make sure I save this footage so we can get a nice little replay here. And uh, Chad says, are you playing any WSOP events? I will definitely be playing the main event. I never miss the main event. I have not missed the main event in 10 years. Uh, I, I will try to play some others, but it, it's hard to... <laughs> Making these takes a lot of time. Uh, let's see. Ray says, any meetups planned in Vegas? I definitely will try to do that. Uh, Ryan says, I joined late and missed most of the webinar, but thanks. I will be getting Master Flop. Seems like a great value. I, I appreciate that. Chad says, I'll be wearing the patches. Nice. Uh, Terrence says, do you like coaching more than playing? That's a really good question. I actually find playing to be more fun, but I find coaching to be more rewarding. Uh, co coaching is rewarding because it's a very, it's very intense, right? Like when you're giving somebody a strategy that they're literally going to put money on, you really have to be right. And that intensity, I wouldn't say it's fun, but it is really rewarding when you get it right. Ken says, are you playing the WPT this week at Parks? I promised a buddy of mine I would go to his uh, MMA fight, so I can't go. Uh, the code? Uh, just go to pokercoaching.com slash assassin, and it'll be right at the bottom. Uh, Renee says, Alex, I've noticed that when I play 30 orbit levels. Let me – hold on, guys. Let me – just in case they want me to record this. Will the master the flop package ever be available to pokercoaching.com subscribers as a webinar? Or it's always gonna be a separate package. That is something I created myself, Bruce. Uh, Renee asks, when I play 30 minute orbit levels versus 12 to 16 orbit levels, I tend to go deeper in tournaments. Is this mental or, or is it strategic? Renee, you probably have more time to exercise your craft, so it is, a little bit metal, but a lot of it is just the number of hands you can get. Let's see. Carrie says, can we use our bonus points on poker coaching? I'm not sure. Somebody asked if they could swap products out um, because they already have some of these. Write me at alex at pokerheadrush.com and I'll see what I can do. Uh, Ray said, listening to exploitative play for the second time, great stuff. How much applies to WCP events, 1,500 and above? 1,500 is a lot, 2,000 and above. you got to be careful because a lot of these guys know this stuff. But, I mean, look around at your table. Like, if they're all grinders, it, the Jonathan Little stuff is really good for that. Jonathan Little stuff is really good at screwing with good players like i love how jonathan little plays poker i i've played i've played with john in vegas quite a bit and he's really hard to 
as somebody who thinks about poker every day, studies poker every day, that stuff is really hard to pick off. So I would, the exploitative stuff is, uh, that tends to be what I use in low to mid stakes. And that tends to be what I teach because it's really fun. And I can simplify it quite a bit, which is really helpful for coaching. Uh, but you do have to work in some of the GTO stuff with better opponents. I'd really recommend reading the limitations of exploitative play. You can find on Jonathan Little's site, that's something I wrote uh, about why I like how, why I like Jonathan Little's style and why I like exploitative lines as well. Uh, someone said, you can use your bonus credits. I've done it many times. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. What are the common mistakes people do when trying to implement overbetting into their strategy? Alex, um, I think they usually, what happens is they get caught like once a month and then they, they get so embarrassed because people make fun of them so much. They just never do it again. That's the biggest mistake I see. Um, I think people overbet for value too much. That's really a good cash game strategy, but most people just kind of poop themselves in tournaments with an overbet in fold. Emily O'Grady says, I play pretty low stakes tournaments and I love learning as much as I can about the game, but there are opponents who have no idea and I find it difficult to shift to a different mode to play against them. E.g. older players who just won't fold a high pair with overcards out there. Uh, reduced bluffing frequency is what I know for sure. How about those players? Emily, if you want the, just the basics, basics of how to win at No Limit Hold'em, play big pots versus wide ranges and just try to get them to fold their high cards. If you get one person heads up, the thing they're going to have most of the time is high cards. Almost any C bet will be profitable. Do not try to get people to fold pairs in low to mid stakes. That is a great way to go broke fast. What you're going to do when, when a bunch of people limp, you got to raise big, right? We're talking like 4X plus 2X for each limper pot plus the big blind, right? You get a heads up versus one player. You see bet. You just try to get their high cards out. If they call you, they've got a pair. It's most likely one of the pairs on the board, and they're not folding it. So if you have a pair that's better than that pair, get every cent you can from them. Never hit the brakes. But if you've missed, you just got to accept reality on reality's terms and wait for your time. So there's a lot of questions while I just went on that tirade. So let me keep going. How would you start playing the first few levels in the WCP and Big 50, aggressive or passive? I show up, I am aggressive from the start. Because you know what, everybody plays like it's, uh, let me ask you this, Douglas. How many times have you played a live tournament, played one hour, looked down at your stack and went, where did 15% of my stack go? I want to be the guy getting everybody's 15% of the stack. Because most people, they open whatever they feel like. You three bet it doesn't seem like that much. They call. And then they're in this pot out of position that they didn't really prepare for. I want to be the initiator in every one of those pots. That's where I want to be. I look for the guy I think is opening too much. Almost everybody opens too much from the low jack, high jack, and cut off now. And I'm just three betting from the start. It seems that one of the biggest things for me to focus on the most is proper bet sizing. Any advice on how to optimize this? Chad, uh, it, the fastest way I could do that is if you think your opponent has a big range, you can bet bigger just to get a lot of the high cards to fold out. If you think it's a tight range, usually you should bet smaller just because if they are folding, they're probably, they were folding to whatever, right? People that play tight ranges tend to have a specific way they play poker. So betting big, since they don't have many high cards anyway, that's not gonna fold them out a ton. You should just take a little shot. Uh, Ryan says, what poker player should I be playing? You should be following Jonathan Little because his stuff is just gangbusters good. Uh, I'd like to think I help a lot of low and mid six guys. That's been my job for a long time and I've seemed to have had a lot of success at it. Um, Evan Jarvis is really good. Matt Affleck is really good. Uh, he doesn't work anymore, but Matthew Jonda is, he created a lot of the stuff that we use today. He's a, uh, you'll, you'll hear Doug Pogue bring him up. And Matthew Jonda like really blew my mind. He has great books. 
Ray Villeman says, any WSOP prep material in particular on the site you would recommend? All of the, actually this one in particular, how to think like a poker player, that just kills in American tournaments, anything below 2K. And then this is how you expand it once you get some guys that start sticking around after the flop. And this stuff just adds even more plays. Emily says, great, thanks so much. Awesome. Arlene says, I've seen a lot of overbetting in lower six tournaments, especially in early levels and a lot early stage due to rebuys. Yeah, and rebuys, people tend to go with it pretty, pretty fast. By the way, that was really funny. Somebody said coffee at five. <laughs> you haven't known me very long. <laughs> The funny thing is, this is a performance, right? I, teaching is very much a performance art. The better you teach, the more people understand. So you have to be engaged, you have to be focused. So showing up here tired is not fair to you guys. You're, you're spending your night learning from me. You could be watching any TV show, you could be watching any streaming site, you could be watching anything, and instead you're here with me. So out of respect for you guys, I always show up with all my notes, I write down a script, I drink a cup of coffee, and I just I'm try to be as present for you guys as possible. Douglas says, thank you so much. Learned so much tonight. You are very welcome. Chad says, thank you. You're very welcome. And then my stuff just blew up. What is the threshold of a buying cost to qualify from small stakes to mid? Chad, it really depends on Chad, the practical consideration is when does the exploitative stuff stop working? And I think it tends to stop working at, like, it tends to be like 2Ks or higher in Vegas, in Europe. On the East Coast, it's like higher than 3.5K. A lot of this stuff worked. I, I'm luck, I recently was lucky enough to get what was it? I played the Borgata event. There was like 1,100 people to start. I got into the final 30 and then I dusted it up, right? But a lot of this stuff worked in the Borgata, like main event, right? It wasn't until the final 30 where I was like, whoa, these guys can play, right? And then you have to start shifting to more of the GTO stuff and you got to start watching your frequencies a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it depends on the part of the world a lot. Somebody asks, is Card Runner's EV a good program? It's a great program. I wrote an entire book using Card Runner's EV, The Myth of Poker Talent. Alex, any chance you can do a webinar on playing draws in and out of position at different stack depths? After getting most of yours and Jonathan Little's webinars, this is the one that I'm not too sure about. That, that definitely has some merits. There's a... Uh, yeah, that'd be a fun one. No, that's a good idea, Chris. I'll think about that. It does come up in a lot of my lectures. The hardest part with poker is it's just so expansive, right? It's, it is so very much, oh, hold on a second, guys. Hold on one second, guys. I have a little, have a little issue. Let's see. One second, everybody. I'm still here. Well, the master the flop package. <sighs> okay. One second, everybody. So, sorry, I just had a little thing come up. Okay. Can't wait to get home and dig into how to think like a poker player. Uh, somebody said they're playing $10 and lower on ACR. This stuff will definitely work there. Is the hit... Uh, is HEM2 worth it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. 
Benjamin Stater says, I'm a beginner plus. What is the best course for me? This is the how to think like a poker player. Benjamin will rocket you up to everything else. S Chad says, so I can navigate the big 50 just a, uh, just as I, uh, just as I would in a $100 tourney, definitely. Richard says, thank you, Alex, always a great webinar. Thank you for saying where to start and how to advance through the products. Is it reasonable to learn this stuff part-time after work in seven weeks? Absolutely. So if you think about it, if you study like seven weeks, yeah, so if you do 30 minutes a day, it's about 15 hours, so you'll get it in about 30 days. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Arlene says, I can't wait to try what you've taught here. Thank you very much. You could be doing something else too. Thank you very much. Oh no, it's, a, it's okay. Uh, Miguel Chavez says, do you know in South America, what is the threshold? I think you're okay pretty much everywhere but Brazil. Uh, it's honestly though, it's been a while since I played in South America. So don't, you, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to use your judgment. A lot of them do learn from the American players though. Any tips for a new poker player trying to improve their game? Playing mostly micro states and have a winning record but can't seem to move up in low to medium stakes? Um, this, uh, honestly, I'm really gonna keep bringing up how to think like a poker player because I was really, like Master the Flop adds a ton of stuff too, but it's, it's very, specialized like on this flop do this how to think like a poker player is what my friends when they need to learn how to play poker that's the one i get them right and it really simplifies things and it'll make you see things in a much different way uh Somebody's asking how advanced uh, the, these ones, this stuff, if you could understand the lecture you just uh, saw, you're gonna be just fine. Ken says, do you have your own podcast? Why, yes I do, go to oneouter.com and you can listen to it. Mark says, thanks Alex, what else are you overbetting on the turn and when you get called and you have ace high, what is your plan on a blank river? Well, the reason why uh, it's a good the reason why it's a good reason to overbet as a bluff is why it's a bad river bet. It's a good idea to double barrel be really big because the guy has a bunch of nothing and he's only calling with the best hands. It's, <laughs> but when he gets to the river, he has the best hands. Therefore, a bet would not be that great. So you really should just check him up. If you think about it, if you want to be balanced, when that guy has a condensed range, that's what Matthew John had talked about, big bets make the most sense because you're not really betting trying to get value from high cards or folding out high cards. It's all pairs. Therefore, value bets should be bigger uh, and bluffs should be bigger. Somebody said, please show the five post-flop plays again. Again, what do you mean overbet the turn when your opponent caps his range? That means when it's unlikely for him to have anything more than a pair, uh, go, go ahead and overbet. So the, here's the five post-flop tricks you can use. Frank says, I have all of these products except for how to think like a poker player. Uh, any way to get it for a discount? Uh, Frank, write me at alex at pokerheadrush.com and I'll talk with John and we can figure something out. Ben says, awesome. I can't tell you how much appreciative you are sharing your knowledge. Hey, this is a really fun job, Ben. Don't worry about it. Thank you for tuning in. It's like helping my little bank robbers. <laughs> We're going to go rob a casino. Right, guys? Here's the schematics. Let's do it. Because, I mean, honestly, if it succeeds, we all work, right? Like, we all do well. Uh, Michael says, thank you so much, as I like all yours and Jonathan webinars and products. Yes, sir. Be sure to be playing, Michael. Be sure to be using all of it. Study, play, study, play. I really appreciate it, Carrie. 
Carrie says, thank you so much for getting me studying Flopzilla and Cardrunner's EV. The first two weeks were frustrating, but it's starting to pay off now. I'm buying you breakfast in Vegas. I like that. Really appreciate that, Carrie. I don't even, I have to eat such boring breakfast now. It's weird when you're playing a poker tournament, you can't eat white carbs because it just gives you this glycemic spike and then you're just screwed, right? And so you have to eat, it's pretty much eggs. Bring your own avocados. Uh, Nicholas says, why check raise three X every time and not higher? Is this to maintain balance or for another reason? I, I find when you go up to three X, Nicholas, that's a really good question. People just call without thinking. Rick says, thank you, Alex. I just, uh, I just purchased. I appreciate. Thank you. Dakota says, thank you. Is this good for online also? Yes, sir. If you go lower than hundred dollar tournaments, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Alex Quinn says, how do you deal with tilt in the middle of tourneys? I've had a hard time shaking off mistakes or hiccups while I'm still playing. Thank you, by the way, for the great content, Alex. That is, uh, the first thing you got to recognize, Alex, is your brain is not meant to gamble. Uh, I would recommend reading any book you can about neuroeconomics if you ever want to do this seriously. Your money and your brain is great. Thinking fast and slow is great. Uh, if you enjoyed Moneyball by Michael Lewis, he wrote another book called The Undoing Project, which is all about this. The human mind is not made for financial risk and reward. Uh, so first of all, your brain is just not meant for it and you really have to train it away Two, you got to play with money you can afford to lose three you got to kind of pretend it's lost and a lot of this you know what i realized a lot of times when i tilted it was entitlement like it's really funny we'll enter a tournament with a thousand people and we all for some reason think moi is gonna win think of how deeply insane that is now Narcissism is actually very natural to the human condition. If you think about a baby, a baby is very narcissistic. It does not think of other creatures because if it were not narcissistic, the baby would probably die. Therefore, the narcissistic baby has to cry out for food. That is very intelligent, right? That is an evolutionary byproduct that has made us go further but it's really hard to get rid of when we're playing poker. We really think these special things are supposed to happen to us. So the way I tell it to myself, Alex, is like, look, if I was going into a fist fight, I would expect to get hit. If I'm going to play no limit hold'em, especially no limit hold'em tournaments, I'm expecting something goofy to happen. Every single time you play poker, no limit hold'em especially, things are going to happen, right? It is not going to be perfect. It never goes right. If I walked into a fist fight and a guy hit me and I turned around and went, he hit me, you would think I was insane. But that's really what it sounds like to me when people go like, I had a pair and he outdrew me. And once I started thinking about it like that, I started doing way better. Renee says, I recently have committed to note taking and targeting, very tiring at first. Now when I don't, it definitely feels like something is missing. What do you recommend? Uh, Renee, if you get tired when you play, the only thing that's going to help you is you got to work out outside of it. Uh, you got to brag post coming, but I lift weights three times a week and it's not, there's a lot of days I show up, I don't want to do it, right? But it's one of those things you're going to feel it if you don't do it, right? You got to eat as well as possible. You got to lift weights. You got to take care of yourself. You can't be drinking anywhere near a tournament. You can't be any of that. Now, let's say you got all of that. Now you got to simplify. The way you simplify is just what do people open? What do people check back? What do people three bet? And do people have any ostentatious behaviors that you can take advantage of? Jim says, thanks, Alex. Great as always. Keith says, off topic, do you drink anymore? Because I would like to have a drink with you and talk minor league baseball. I am totally fine having a coffee and talking baseball, but I have retired from drinking. I had a good run. But uh, yeah, I just can't do it anymore. Hi, Alex. I enjoyed your commentary on Stones and Twitch. Thank you, Gary. I really appreciate that. Awesome job, Alex. You and Jonathan are my favorite teachers. Why, thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. 
Georges Gurgiu says, hey, you be. You from Astoria? You sound like you are. <laughs> anyway, just purchase the assassin package. Let the fun begin. Thank you, Alex. And nice. I appreciate that, George. Carrie says, what's your favorite app for taking notes at the table while playing? Just anything would work. Evernote, OneNote, anything. Thanks, Alex. I enjoyed the thought and analysis. You are welcome, Matt. I appreciate that. Frank says, any advice on how to deal with extended periods of being card dead or a video on that you'd recommend? Remember, it's eight people versus one, and you only get to see 30 hands an hour. It would be really strange if you didn't have a two-hour span where you didn't get a hand. Dave says, entitlement plus pride has cost me lots of tourneys. Me and you, too. Me and you both, brother. I'm going to put this out just again. Boom! Discount. Offer ends May 19th, 2019. Michael says, what do you think of mirrored glasses and the use of them? I like to use them from time to time for variance. I, as long as you can keep them not exposing your cards. I wear sunglasses when I'm tired. I don't want people watching me. My eyes, I, my eyes shift around a lot, so everybody always thinks I'm bluffing, which is not good. Dave says, how much do you incorporate poker tells into your game? The really big one, uh, Zachary Elwood has a book that's like $10 on Audible, or even if it's 20, you should pay for it. It's called Exploiting Poker Tells, but that will help you with most of it. The big thing is when people, have you ever looked at your hand before it's your turn to act and it's aces? Did you make any noise? No, most people are quiet as a church mouse when they look down at a big hand, and that tends to extend to pre-flop and flop. So any ostentatious behavior at those times tends to clip off the biggest hands. It might still be ace-king, it might still be tens, but it's not gonna be aces, right? But the thing about that is if I can clip aces and kings and queens from your range, I can three bet with abandon, right? And there are guys that have tells like that, really big online players. And Jennifer says, Alex, thank you for this excellent material. For students considering your products, I would highly recommend any of them. I started with one, and when I finished, I couldn't wait to see the next. Each one has overlapping concepts, but also new concepts to grow and learn from that. They all fit together. I'm working through each one for a second time, and maybe we'll even do some three times. Alex is the best teacher, and his videos cover the top concepts to help me to help solidify your game. Thank you very much, John. Really appreciate that. Steve says, you're the best, my friend. No, you're the best, Steve. It's really good to see you here, Steve. Bob in Florida says, off subject, but I got to ask, what's the reason the open raises are 2.5x at 100 big blind stacks? Is this a new norm or just a convenience? Uh, just a convenience and to make it look like a table you'd actually see. Bob, Bob says, thanks for the books. Got them both. Glad you got them. And the other thing... Uh, no, I mean, the big, a lot of people ask me, why do you like big raises? And it's like, well, I like big pots versus big ranges, heads up. So if I can make it 3.5x and nobody else will touch it, but the big blind will call, that's what I'm going to do, right? But there's sometimes when you're dealing with short stacks and people are just going to jam regardless of the bet size, you don't need to go that big. And sometimes I'll show you guys 2.5x raises to make it look more like your games. Nicholas says, how do you handle massive downswings? Uh... You gotta only play with money you can afford to lose. You gotta play with a pornographically large bankroll and play the lowest stakes you can, you can stand. It was the biggest bankroll net who ever played the game and everybody made fun of me and I'm still here 13 years later. Went pro in 2006, biggest bankroll net you've ever seen. And every time I have not followed bankroll guidelines, I, I've regretted it. Michael says, have you ever fallen asleep at the table? <laughs> yep. I haven't realized I shouldn't play this day. Yeah, I did, I did that. Uh, like when I was younger, I just lived at the card room, right? So yeah, there were definitely times that happened. That's not a good idea. Uh, Mikey sa Mickey says, what types of food to stay away from during long multi-day tourneys? Mickey, uh, I would really recommend uh, 
like good healthy fats. What tends to help me the most, and obviously this is a sample size of one, but like avocados, cashews, almonds, stuff like that, lean protein tends to be really good and lots of veggies. Mark says, you rap in these days? Can we get a bar now? I don't rap when I'm at work, man. I'm a, I don't know. I get, I'll get back to battling. It's just, you know, I've been trying to make my business work lately. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap this up here pretty soon. Lace is off now. Alex, thanks. We'll definitely buy the package. Thank you for that. Should I have a study session with my local 20 to 30 weekly tournament buddies to make them better so it helps me play better or let them be terrible to be against terrible players? Uh, I would really... That's a good one. No, nah, I, I would learn how to play with bad players and then you'll you'll find good players to talk with. Gary says, could you recommend a good mouse? Um, you know what, Gary? I never found a mouse that worked really well. I just work with a carp carpal tunnel glove perpetually now. And you can do wrist exercise. Dave says, thanks. Gary says, thanks. Chad says, thanks. Chad says, you're a G. I appreciate that. Thomas says, thanks, Alex. My big win, 194K this year was right after 15 hours of studying your stuff. Dear God. Can I... Holy hell, can I quote you on that? Gary says, oh, well, thank Chuck says, thanks, Alex. Nicholas, thanks. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> really, Thomas Kornachuk. I'm going to remember that. Steve says, Logitech Mouse. And thank you. Chad says, thank you. John says, thank you for your time. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you, Gary. All right, everybody, I'm going to wrap this up. You guys have a great night. You guys have a great night. I really appreciate you being out here. Take care.